All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Missing American Jury featuring Professor Suja Thomas, author of the Missing American Jury. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Professor Thomas. <laughs> Suja Thomas is a professor of law at the University of Illinois. Her research includes, among other things, extensive work on the criminal jury, the civil jury, and the grand jury. The Missing American Jury, written by Professor Thomas, was published in 2016, and this book kind of blew me away. It was so packed with eye-opening information, as you can see from my extensive sticky notes here. <laughs> hard, hard to skip a paragraph without putting a sticky note on it, I thought. If you have ever looked at the jury system as it is today and wondered what in the heck the founders were thinking, this book is so incredibly enlightening for that and many other reasons. She is now working on a documentary related to her research, which we'll talk a bit about today, and was a 2020 fellow with Cartemquin Films Diverse Voices in Documentaries program. I'm so excited for you to be here. I'm going to try not to fangirl too much. We did that a little bit in the rehearsal, but for everyone at home, the Missing American Jury can't recommend it enough, and we will actually be doing a virtual reading group coming up in April and May. Um, so hopefully you'll get just enough from this uh, webinar to induce you to join us for that. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started with the questions here. I, oh, I should mention for our audience, if you have a question, we may get to some of them or, or I'm not totally sure how many we'll get to because I have a lot of questions. But if you go to the bottom of your screen on Zoom, there's a Q&A feature you can use. If you're on Facebook, put your question in the chat. I'm not totally sure how often I'll get over there because it's just me running all the controls today. <laughs> all right, Professor Thomas, <laughs> uh, given the prevalence of images of the jury in American pop culture, uh, we have like 12 Angry Men. Right now on television, there's a primetime jury related drama called Bull. I think a lot of people think that jury trials are common and accessible to anyone accused of a crime. Yet you have written this book called The Missing American Jury, it's complete with milk carton image. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about why you would do that? Sure, thanks for having me uh, today and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone on this uh, webinar. So yeah, uh, I wrote this book uh, to call attention to the fact that very, very few cases get tried by juries. Um, less than 4% of criminal cases are tried by juries and less than 1% of civil cases are decided by juries. And on top of that, we have one other jury, the, the grand jury, and the grand jury um, decides um, whether or not cases um, go forward in very, very um, few situations. And not only have you written a book about this, but this research that you've done is kind of spurring uh, you on to even more publication, this time in the form of a documentary. You wanna talk a little bit about why you're doing that and, and what you're trying to do with that? Yeah, I'd kind of like to go back in time a little bit just to kind of tell um, everyone why I became interested in this topic. And, and so many years ago, I was a lawyer and I represented someone in a discrimination case and, um, and we won a jury verdict um, on behalf of our client. And um, he won a verdict of uh, some, some money in back pay as well as $220,000 in emotional distress damages. And so I was super excited about that. He was excited about that. And then the judge, said, no, it should be $20,000, not $220,000. And I was shocked. I had actually never heard of this procedure um, called remitter in um, law school. And so I started seeing different procedures that were being used and that got in the way of juries even trying cases. And so what ended up happening is I, I wrote some books, including The Missing American Jury, um, I did some op-eds, I did a TED animated video, um, all to try to motivate change to get the public to know that juries decide few cases to get this system um, back on track. Um, but it hasn't you know, created the change that I wanted so far. So I saw the food documentaries as a way that change had been motivated and some of the 
viewers that may have seen some of those. And, and so um, that's why I've embarked on doing a documentary on this subject. I'm gonna show how real people have been affected by the fact that very few um, juries decide cases. And this is really devastating um, to, um, you know, sort of our system that was originally conceived to have the jury a significant part of the, you know, our democratic system. And so the documentary that you're working on, can you give us a little bit of uh, detail on uh, what you're trying to do and convey with that? Sure. Yeah, with the with the documentary, um, we're gonna we're gonna have we have some real people um, who won a person who was um, innocent but pled guilty because of the penalty in years um, in prison that he would face because um, he actually gained to take the jury trial. So that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about here today is that. Juries try very few cases on the criminal front because prosecutors can say, we're gonna penalize you for taking the jury trial by sending you to more time in prison if you actually take the jury trial. So we're featuring someone who pled guilty even though he was innocent. Um, we're featuring another person who um, had um, was sexually assaulted um, by her employer. And a judge said, no, that's not sexual harassment. You can't go to a jury to have a jury decide that case um, when that particular person actually admitted that they did what they, they did. Um, and so those are just a couple of the people we're featuring to show that this has a real impact on real people every day. Yeah, I'm gonna share a link in the chat to Professor Thomas's website. Uh, one of the things that will be interest, it, instrumental in getting that documentary made is funding. So uh, if you wouldn't, wouldn't uh, mind, would you tell people how they can help with that? Yeah, if, you, if you're compelled by this subject at all um, and you wanna contribute, uh, uh, Kristen, Kirsten has put um, in the chat uh, a link to my website. And if you go to that website, on that website, it talks a little bit about the documentary and it has a button that says donate and you can press on that button. And then it goes to the University of Illinois website, which is the university that employs me. Uh, you can get a tax deduction um, by, you know, when you give to this film. Um, and so you can, there's a fund place um, and it says annual fund. You don't, you actually don't press on that. You, press down on the Suja Thomas documentary fund. And then you'll see that you can press on that. And if you want to give, you can give. And you, as I said, it's tax deductible. Thanks for thinking about that. But now we're gonna go on and talking about the- book. Awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited. I even got it on the Facebook chat. So we're good there. <laughs> now, it seems like, I think to a lot of us that so many things in the legal system don't make sense. And what it's, it, it from your book, it seems like a lot of those don't make sense because they're essentially flipped 180 degrees from where they began. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of those, starting with the trials by jury and plea bargains. Now, a few years back, I was listening to oral arguments for the case of Jay Lee versus United States, which had reached the Supreme Court. Mr. Lee took a plea bargain after being incorrectly informed by his attorney that he would avoid deportation from the country where he had lived his entire adult life if he took this bar plea bargain. It turned out to be wrong. His attorney said, it's totally my fault, I was wrong. Uh, so it went to, to uh, he tried to appeal to get a jury trial instead. And the government was arguing this man didn't have a right to a jury trial. <laughs> and during the oral arguments, twice at least, Justice Sonia Sotomayor noted that trial by jury is guaranteed in the constitution, whereas plea bargaining isn't. So how exactly uh, do, sh should we understand uh, the situation where the government is standing in front of the Supreme Court arguing that constitutionally guaranteed rights must be subordinated to their preferred non-constitutional methods of, of dealing with things? Yeah, so this is sort of, has been a process over time. So our jury in the United States was based on the English jury. And so that jury was such that we did have grand juries decide whether criminal defendants should be tried. Um, then we had juries decide um, whether people should uh, are convicted of crimes. And virtually everyone took the jury trial and almost no one pled guilty. 
So then we, we established that system in the United States. We very much established it based on this history in England. And then what happens is around um, the end of the Civil War, um, we have um, some increase in crime and we have um, uh, some um, establishment of this idea of plea bargaining. And that is to incentivize someone to plead guilty by getting some benefit. Um, and, and so um, at that point in time, we did have an increase or we had sort of this establishment of this idea of plea bargaining. Again, then sort of we get to all the way to essentially World War II. By then we're up to probably over 80% plea bargaining, this kind of acceptance of the system. But even at that point in time, there wasn't a significant penalty um, I mean, I'm sure criminal defendants thought it was a significant penalty, but not where we are today. And so some people felt like they could go to a jury trial. But then you get into the 70s and 80s, again, this idea of an increase in crime rates, and then some incentives by legislatures to actually enact laws that um, drive plea bargaining to increase. And so we have, for example, in New York, we have the Rockefeller laws that put in place mandatory minimums for certain drug crimes. Um, and what that allows a prosecutor to do is to say, if you do not plead guilty to this crime, I'm going to charge you with this crime that comes with a mandatory minimum. And this also was established in the federal system. And then on top of that, we have federal sentencing guidelines and those federal sentencing guidelines allow, um, and then also in the states, allow a prosecutor to say, you are going to get a benefit um, for not taking the jury trial or pleading guilty, or in other words, be um, uh, to your detriment if you actually take a jury trial. And so all of these things contribute then to prosecutors being able to use sentencing to incentivize or what I would say coerce someone into pleading guilty, even if someone is innocent. And I would say, even if someone is an innocent, to me, that's the whole point. You have a right to a jury trial, and we're going to talk about why that's important, even if someone is, is, is not innocent. Um, but we get to the point then where we are today, which is very few cases um, tried by juries in criminal cases. And, and you know, there are other patterns in the civil side, on the civil side, but we have, you know, less than 1% of civil cases tried by juries as well. Under the Constitution as it is currently written, do you think that plea bargaining is legal or kind of what's its status and should there be a future for plea bargaining or should it be done away with? Is there something else we can do? Any, any thoughts in that direction? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, plea bargaining is absolutely unconstitutional. Um, I'm going to be one of the only people that um, says that, um, but it's absolutely true. Um, again, the jury in the United States was based on the English jury, um, and so the right to a jury, jury trial did it not involve that prosecutors could um, penalize you with more time in prison for actually taking the jury trial. And so this is just a total turning on, a head, on its head, a right that exists in the constitution. Um, I wanna just briefly say so that we can give this some context. The United States Supreme Court said yes to plea bargaining in a few different cases, but one of them is the Borden Kircher case. And um, if any of you are interested, you can take a look at this case from the seventies. And this is a case where, where the criminal defendant was charged with forging a check for about $90. And the prosecutor said to him, plead guilty and you'll get five years in prison. But if you don't plead guilty, you're gonna get life in prison. And so this criminal defendant said, no, I'm not going to plead guilty um, uh, and get five years in prison for a four check of $90. Um, I'm gonna take my jury trial. He takes his jury trial. He gets sentenced to life in prison when he's convicted. And he takes that case all the way to the United States Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court in a five to four decision says, Plea bargaining is this important part of our criminal justice system, essentially efficiency argument. And one of the things that I want to, you know, sort of emphasize is that there's nothing about efficiency in the in the in the Constitution. Um, and I would argue that our system of juries can be more efficient um, if we have some reform. And that's a lot of that is is because of you know lawyers and judges and us and us not being as good as we can be. But regardless of that. 
there's absolutely nothing in the Constitution that says we need to be efficient. Um, and this system, in other words, is made up and we need to, you know, we need to, to make change. I really like your point about efficiency, because one thing that has struck me over the years is we're a very efficiency uh, geared society in the United States, but sometimes it's inefficiency that is protective. <laughs> Not always, but it's something to consider that uh, the purpose of the system isn't to like crank out convictions and, and other verdicts as quickly as possible. It's to uphold justice <laughs> in theory. <laughs> and so looking at it from an efficiency standpoint is gonna bring people to different conclusions about how it should operate versus looking at it from a justice standpoint. So thank you very much for bringing that point up. Um, kind of along those lines, another thing that doesn't seem to make sense to a lot of people is the situation with grand juries. The, the standard uh, stereotype is that uh, except in cases of police or, or government officials, uh, grand juries can indict a ham, sa ham sandwich. And what a lot of us have wondered, I think, is, um, Oh, I'm, I'm told I'm loud and you're fairly quiet. <laughs> so how about I back up and you scoosh up? <laughs> and and I'll, I'll try and I'll try and moderate my my volume here a little bit. Yeah, in terms of grand juries, I think what we have to think about is what the intention was and where we are. And so I all of this conversation, I want everyone to be clear that, you know, the jury, just like other parts of government, there can be reform. And, you know, if we if we um, uh, reinvigorate the jury um, reform can be part of that. But um, originally when we're thinking about the grand jury, you, you needed 12 people on a grand jury to say yes to someone um, having that case go forward. And then you needed 12 people on a jury um, to convict um, that person. And so you had 24 people standing in the way of someone being convicted of a crime. And now we have um, one person, um, and we can talk about this more, but sometimes it's a police officer uh, because they don't do a lot of investigation at the prosecutor level, especially in, in states, um, and, um, or it's the, the prosecutor. And so instead essentially of, of 24 people standing in the way of someone going to prison, we have one person standing in the way of someone going to prison. So, so even if, let's say, the grand jury isn't the significant um, stop um, place, um, it can be a stop place. And so, for example, if, if anyone wants to look up um, in 2013, there's an example that you can see on the web um, that's, that's described of a person, uh, a teenager who um, posted something on Facebook um, that was a rap. Um, that involves saying, you know, words like the White House, um, saying some other words, and um, he was prosecuted in Massachusetts, uh, and he could have received 20 years in prison from what I've read about this. And this case went to a grand jury, and the grand jury said no. And, you know, so, so grand juries um, sometimes will stand in the way. And then I will also say, with respect to grand juries, who, who which sometimes will just sort of uh, say no in in some police cases. Um, I don't think that's probably the problem of the grand jury. It might be the problem of what evidence is presented by the prosecution in some of those cases. And I encourage some of you to take a look at um, the the Ferguson case. Uh, I saw a really interesting presentation by our law students at the University of Illinois um, of that grand jury um, proceeding because it's available and they and they acted it out and used the, the actual transcript. Um, so so you so you have to kind of like look under the hood to see what's going on. And so again, reform is possible and absolutely necessary in the jury system, but it is a fantastic system if we use it in the right way. Yeah, speaking of the the Ferguson case, uh, that also brings to mind the um, grand jury that was uh, supposedly convened to investigate the killing of Breonna Taylor. And it came out <laughs> that the uh, prosecution had publicly misled us to believe that they had put all kinds of effort into it and were really trying to indict 
Um, and then when that happened, some of the, I believe three of the grand jurors went to an attorney and uh, filed to get permission to speak publicly about what really happened, which surprisingly they got. <laughs> and when that happened, it came out that they weren't offered nearly the level of charges that they had been expected, or that they had expected to be offered and which we, the public, were led to believe they had been offered and rejected. Um, do you have any thoughts on how grand jurors can push back in these sorts of situations or um, anything, anything that can be done outside of, you know, the grand jurors themselves to help? It's, it's kind of a tough situation because grand jury secrecy, there is a reason for that, but it's kind of got the two sides. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, thanks for mentioning that example, and that's a you know great more you know, pertinent example. I think, I think I, I right now I, I don't have any sort of cures for this system. I think that um, you know it's pretty basic to me in this in in the way that if a prosecution wants to go forward with a case, it has to present the best case that it has, um, and you know in cases where there isn't a good case, you know it is upon the prosecution to do some investigation and to, to do the right thing and not prosecute those cases. And I think that um, a lot of that work at this point needs to be done um, by prosecutors. I think the grand jurors in the, um, the, in the situation where um, Brianna Taylor was killed, um, I think that you know they obviously I think did a great job in doing what they could do to to come forward through a through a lawyer, and and so you know I, I think in this world of of media and social media, um, there are more opportunities for uh, people to step up. Uh, but right now, I think we all we need all of this reinvigorated, and then we can think about much more in terms of reform. Yeah. Yeah. Um Another thing that seems to have been flipped around, and I'm going to try and tie this back to the grand jury as well, <laughs> is the, it used to be, well, the, it used to be that people were fully informed and knowledgeable about jurors' right to judge the laws as well as the facts in the case. And you talk about in the book, for example, the case of John Peter Zenger, who seemed very well protected by conscientious jurors, not only trial jurors, but also grand jurors. Can you briefly summarize that case for us, for those who are not familiar with it yet, and then compare Zinger's jurors and their knowledge about jury nullification to maybe more typical jurors today? Sure, yeah. So in this case, um, you had this uh, newspaper publisher, uh, journalist, um, who published this newspaper sort of um, voicing disagreement with the royal governor. And so he was charged with libel and the law at that point was different than the law is now. And so what he was he had done essentially was illegal. And, and so he was um, attempted to be indicted by a grand jury and the grand jury said no. And then they put it towards another grand jury and the grand jury said no. And then they sort of usurped the grand jury and went to trial and went to trial and the, the jury um, uh, said no. Um, and, and so this is a great example of the power of the jury to say, even if um, there is a law and it's been violated, we as a community get to decide whether or not that is a good thing. And um, more recently in talking about my documentary with um, with various folks. I, I heard about a couple of cases um, in the South recently where people were prosecuted for drug crimes and juries have said no and have in, you know, invoked nullification. And of course, uh, Kirsten, you know of many more of those circumstances. And, and I know that's, you know, your organization is very much um, wants to inform uh, jurors of that. So, so now, um, you know, the there isn't, um, the, the court hasn't, um, you know, allowed, courts aren't allowing uh, jurors to know about this right um, by an affirmative sort of um, instruction, telling them about this right. 
And, um, and so, you know, it takes away the power um, of uh, jurors, you know, when they're actually told you need to follow the law, this is the law, you need to follow this law, when really, you know, in the scheme of things and given history, they don't. Um, no, that, that, that is part and parcel of our history and of, our, and, and of the right to a jury trial that's in our constitution. Yeah, I have one eyeball over on the Facebook comments and Bob Smiley reminds me that we actually have um, Eric Haley, who has done a lot of volunteer work for FIJA, who actually received jury nullification information from Bob and then proceeded to get called on a grand jury and utilize that information. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you, met, you, you were talking about this because I'd forgotten about that. And, it, and we also um, uh, have talked about a grand jury in Tucson that was doing exactly what you said. They became known as the new, notorious 269th <laughs> because several of the grand jurors started refusing to um, rubber stamp indictments for felony drug crimes for like minor possession and things like that. So yeah, it, it's definitely a, a realistic thing that can be done even now, despite people not necessarily knowing about it. <laughs> now, you talked a little bit earlier about a, a 1970s Supreme Court decision, I think, and you point out in your book that the general attitude of the Supreme Court to jury authority of this sort has sort of risen and fallen over time. One of the big developments in jury rights in the last year or so has been that the Supreme Court made a dramatic, I would say long overdue, reversal of a terrible decision from the 1970s um, in which states had been permitted to allow juries to convict without un unanimous agreement. So that ruling seems hopeful to me. But there have also been some decisions that have greatly upset me in recent years, <laughs> notably for want of one more justice to agree to hear the case. The court had refused to review a case in which the accused had their sentence for a minor drug offense drastically enhanced because the judge felt he was guilty of a whole slew of these other more serious charges of which the jury had explicitly acquitted him. I, I think the term for this is sentencing on acquitted conduct. Um, the court has also lost Justices Scalia and Ginsburg, who, at least to me, to my not particularly uh, plugged in, uh, knowledgeable self, they struck me as both at least somewhat friendly to juries. <laughs> so I'm just curious, do you have a general sense of the court as it is now composed? Is this likely to be good or bad for preserving or restoring trial by jury? Um, any, any sort of temperature check that you might want to share on that. Sure, and I just want to make one other comment. So you were talking about kind of the unanimous jury um, being sort of you know, uh, approved of, um, which is terrific, uh, you know, that the Supreme Court came down that way. And unfortunately, you know, it should have been, I think, a lot earlier than that. Um, but one of the things that we still have remaining is that we have fewer than 12 people required um, and, uh, you know, that's significant. So essentially you can have a six person jury convict someone when it should be a 12 person jury. Um, and, and the United States Supreme Court has said yes to, uh, to, to six people deciding as opposed to 12 people. Imagine that, like historically, it was supposed to be 12 people you know, again, 12 on the grand jury, 12 on the, on the jury uh, unanimously deciding. And instead, we have um, only a requirement of six. And, and so I, I wanted to also just point that out to people that, that we have another major problem and the United States Supreme Court should revisit that question and, and should decide that it needs to be 12. Of course, we don't have any cases going to juries. So, you know, we have to get, you know, we have to solve the plea bargaining problem, probably uh, more importantly. But um, in terms of um, your question, the, the jury generally, um, you know, where we look at history the, and we actually like sort of comply with history, that actually really helps in terms of jury authority. And so we have had various justices on the Supreme Court, such as Justice Scalia, 
who has been more tied to history um, than many of the other justices. Right now on the court, we have um, uh, uh, Justice um, Gorsuch has some um, sort of tie and, and interest in the jury and has written certain uh, sort of opinions that kind of, um, even when he was not on the Supreme Court um, uh, in favor of jury authority. Um, with that said, um, I think there's always some hope on the criminal front in terms of jury authority right now in terms of plea bargaining and getting rid of plea bargaining, there's, there's really no hope because everyone seems to think that's an important part of the criminal justice system and we need to get that turned on its head to have people like, for example, bail reform um, that's been, you know, people have been turning that on its head. Well, I think this needs to be turned on its head in terms of plea bargaining. But uh, outside of plea bargaining, I think on the criminal front, there's more of a likelihood to, to tie things to history. So for example, what you were talking about and using um, you know, factual determinations by juries to, to, um, to determine whether or not a sentence can be imposed. That's something that you know, over time, the court has been in favor of and has made decisions um, that support that. On the civil side, which we haven't talked much of and maybe we'll touch on a little bit um, later, the, the court's not as interested in that, even though the civil jury is absolutely extremely important part of the constitution. So I don't have much hope on the civil side at all. I have a little hope on the criminal side, but not with respect to the significant issue in that being plea bargaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the only the only bright light I can kind of sort of see on on the civil side is I know that uh, Sonia Sotomayor was interviewed by New York University School of Law's civil jury project, and she seemed pretty friendly to civil juries. Yeah, I mean there was a, there was an opinion um, where she I think it was either, I think it was a case where she wanted the case to be taken um, on cert. And, and and it was involving, I think, a police, um, a police shooting of um, of people who should not have been shot um, and um, who were innocent, uh, kind of sort of people just because essentially of their race, it looked like that they were being um, uh, targeted. And uh, you know, she talked about how you know that was that there was a jury question in that case. Um, so so I think. You know, uh, yeah, Justice Sotomayor may be someone who can can kind of be a jury champion uh, um, in, in some of these cases. But I think we, we have a, a an uphill battle right now in the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of the number of jurors. That's not something we had talked about before this. But if you don't mind, I would love love to ask a couple questions about that. <laughs> um, so. If I recall correctly, the stripping down of the jury size from 12 to 6 kind of goes back to that same 1970s Supreme Court that seemed to hate juries. <laughs> I don't know if that's just through my filters, but they seem very, very, uh, they touched on a lot of jury issues and were ruled very unfavorably. Uh, and I was kind of, I, I think one of them basically described the number 12 as an accident of history or something to that effect. And I'm wondering if you think that a challenge to that would be more likely either to criminal jury size or civil jury size, if that would be received more um, uh, favorably by the current court, or if if that's something I, I don't know where 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 can we go with that? Are there possibilities there? Yeah, I I think that given the decision um, on unanimity. I think that given that, that there is some hope to, to looking at the 12 person jury. Um, I think that the difference there is that they're going to be thinking about efficiency. They're going to be thinking about uh, lack of resources. And, um, and as a result, you know, it may be too early uh, to make that challenge, but I, I certainly have more hope after um, the, you know, the unanimity decision that, um, that this might be something that could be challenged. But one other thing that I want to say in relationship to this is, you know, 
all of you viewers, one of the things that you might want to kind of recognize is that over time, like if I have a, a graph or a figure in my book, and it shows how there are decisions by the United States Supreme Court that say yes to jury authority, and then 20 years later on the same issue, they say no to jury authority. And that being said, and I'll give you an example. So in a civil case, uh, after you win a, a jury trial, if you're a plaintiff and you win a jury trial, originally this was challenged and they wanted to sort of say, oh, a judge could overrule the jury. And the United States Supreme Court said, no, no, a judge cannot overrule a jury. Um, and then just 20 years later, the United States Supreme Court said, oh yes, a jury can decide and then a judge can overrule a jury. And this may sound outrageous to you, and it really is, and it is so odd, but a judge will say, I don't think a reasonable jury could find for the plaintiff. And as a result, I'm going to say that I'm right. And the jury, which was picked by the two sides and spent lots of time picking that jury, the jury's wrong. And as a result, the other side wins. And, 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 and originally, again, the United States Supreme Court said, no, that's not, that's not constitutional. And then 20 years later said yes. So we have this history of over time, the United States Supreme Court uh, saying no um, to jury authority over time after it already said, yes, the jury has this authority. So essentially, this, there's been a grab from a, the authority from other parts of government. All these other parts of government have more authority, and the jury has very little authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, I really am, am thinking how much the efficiency problem kind of comes into play even more now during the pandemic, because something I've seen in more than one state is, oh, we have this huge backlog of people who are at least not yet ruling out their right to trial by jury. What are we going to do? Oh, let's cut the number of jury jurors on these, these trials from 12 to, I've seen down to eight or six. I think six is the minimum currently allowed by the Supreme Court. So there it is, you know, just basically eroding your rights for the sake of efficiency. And maybe you can give us an idea of why do we care if it's 12 instead of eight or six? Well, I, I you know, to me, um, you need uh, one, I do think history matters here. There's a, there was a reason why we established the trial by jury. It was literally people, you know, if you look at, at historically many, of the founders say it was the most important right. And, and that right was 12 jurors um, convicting someone, you know, putting aside the civil jury for now, but convicting someone of a crime. Now you're saying six have to agree as opposed to 12. Well, that's a big difference. Um, and if I'm accused of a crime, I think we should stick with what we, we, we established and was a really great system that we thought was a great system. Um, and I don't think that the United States Supreme Court itself would be able to change that system in, in, in favor of efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it's, it's to get 12 people to decide versus to get six people to decide, it's a huge, it's a huge difference. Yeah. And, and especially in terms of like jury nullification, you know, having to convince 12 people instead of just six when there is a unanimity requirement, which there is now, <laughs> that that's definitely a huge game changer. And particularly in the last year, a, totally disheartening to me, um, especially in light of your description of the Chinese jury system in the book, is the new law that was widely protested in Hong Kong. It seems like every day I see another news article about someone being arrested, they're not getting a jury trial. Special judges loyal to the Chinese government are now basically the ones deciding if political protesters, people protesting the government, will be convicted of major crimes like terrorism and incitement to secession. Um, are there any other countries that seem to you to have made notable shifts in the last few years, either in terms of degrading jury rights and protections or Perhaps, if you have any, toward improving them. <laughs> dare, <Yeah>. dare I hope? <laughs> I, I, I'd like to focus on the positive and 
uh, a lot of this, uh, I focused on sort of the negative, which unfortunately, you know, the jury being this is in my mind, very, very detrimental to our democracy. But um, we do see some other places in the world uh, that are um, kind of uh, reinvigorating even um, their jury system. So in Argentina, uh, they actually have a long history of a constitutional um, right to a jury trial, but it lay dormant for many, 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 many years. And in 2011, um, they started kind of a reinvigoration of that jury system. And now in several provinces, they have a criminal jury trial uh, and they based our, their jury actually on our, our system in the United States. Um, and, um, and so that's uh, to me a very nice uh, uh, development. And so Buenos Aires is one of the provinces that um, has um, a, a criminal jury trial. Uh, and then more recently, they have this phase two of this, which is uh, putting in place a civil jury. And so they are um, excited about um, the idea of having uh, community decision making on such issues as um, uh, consumer rights types of issues, tort issues, some class action type issues. And so they do think that the community should be involved in these types of matters. And so it's neat, I think, to see another country that based their uh, jury on our system, um, you know, uh, sort of saying now that this is an important, uh, you know, uh, an institution that should decide important um, issues. And, um, and so I think we can look to that to say, there's some continued hope for the importance of yeah. lay participation in our in our system. Yeah, well, just in general, it, one thing that has always struck me as important about the participant of lay participation is, I, I had someone recently say, oh, we should narrow down who can get on a jury just to people with voter registration, because they are, you know, that signals that they are more politically, you know, involved and knowledgeable and, you know, aware they're not just J random person off the street kind of thing. And I thought, well, actually, it kind of seems to me like it should be the opposite because we are all subject to the laws. And if we can't all understand them, if it takes some special knowledge or awareness to understand them, maybe we shouldn't be imposing a lot of those types of laws on people, If especially if we're going to go around saying, oh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really it's really encouraging to hear that, you know, some other place in the world is is like increasing their appreciation for that sort of participation. That's that's very hopeful indeed. <laughs> I, I, I should have probably put this question before that because I don't want to put a damper on this, but I, I do think we probably should touch on the pandemic a little bit. I didn't want to make this whole thing about it because everything has been about it, but uh, it seems like the pandemic has really devastated our jury system in this last year we have some courts where jury trials have been at a complete halt for months on end, where they're resuming. It's at a snail's pace and under extremely unappealing circumstances. Uh, some places have face shields or masks, or there are questions about not wearing a mask because how do you see or assess a witnesses or jurors' truthfulness if they're wearing a mask? <laughs> There's plexiglass all over courtrooms in the Derek Chauvin trial that's going on right now. On day one, they had to remove some plexiglass because there were so much plexiglass that there were reflections and people couldn't see each other through that. <laughs> and the public is largely excluded from courtrooms. The, the trial of the three St. Louis police officers, um, you couldn't, of course, go in. And so I tried to see that online and you couldn't do that. In that federal court, you would have to email someone register with them and they would send you a phone number and you would have to sit there on your phone listening and also they you're not allowed to record it so you can't go watch it in a convenient format later and but most of all speedy trial rights are, are being largely thrown under the bus <laughs> uh, is this kind of a temporary situation or do you think there will be some longer term impact years from now after it's over where do you kind of see this situation going 
Yeah, unfortunately, I think the pandemic makes everything worse. Um, we already have a situation where we have people in the system who think that there are not enough resources and aren't even asking for more resources to have more jury trials. And then you have now where people actually wanted a jury trial, they're, they're being you know, asked to wait for one. Some of them will give up um, and plead guilty you know, in criminal cases. Some of them on the civil side will you know, give up and settle. Some of those people will, because judges feel more pressure, will actually dismiss more cases, um, I believe, because there's more pressure. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, uh, this makes everything worse. Uh, and um, yeah, I, 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 I wish I had something to say, that yeah. was, but it just makes everything worse. Yeah, yeah. Since you mentioned resources, I thought I'd in integrate one of our audience questions here. Um, uh, let's see, I believe this was Shannon. Yes, Shannon. Shannon says, in my understanding, jury trials are expensive. And even though there is a constitutional right to jury trials, there's little to no federal funding for jury trials at the state level. And states have varying levels of financial resources. Uh, do you have any thoughts on a solution to the funding problem? Sure, I think um, that's certainly an important question. And I think we can start thinking about that question when we actually kind of like get away from the idea that it's okay to, let's say on the criminal side, tax um, the jury trial. I think that you have to value the right. There's no value for the right right now. But let me like sort of, you know, I know that sounds sort of like I'm avoiding the question and I'm not. I think you have to value the right to give resources to the right. And right now, um, currently, there isn't a value placed on this right. Everyone in the system believes that it's okay. Um, not everyone, but prosecutors in the system um, for the most part, judges in the system believe it's okay to penalize people for, for exercising the right. And if that's the case, then if all the people in the system think that, there's no effort to actually put resources into uh, the system. And, and there are lots of, there's lots of money. There's lots of money. I'm not saying that, that, that states don't lack money, but there is lots of money. They put lots of people in prison. To me, if you're going to make things laws that are, are criminalized, uh, criminalized um, matters, you have to put resources into what the constitution actually requires and that is trials. So, so you know, we almost need to back up and say, okay, we put all these laws in place to criminalize conduct and now we're doing some kind of efficiency thing to throw people in prison. And again, I'm just focusing on the criminal side at this point. And I think we need to back up and say, what are the resources to actually do that? And I, and I do think there are resources. I think there are resources that are out there. On the, I'll just focus for a second on the federal level. And I know this is different than the state level. I live in Illinois. Let's just say, if you look at the stats for Illinois, we don't have, a, we, we have less money, it looks like at least than, than most states. But on the federal side, you know, there's tons of money put into beautiful courthouses that are empty. There's tons of money put into just lots of other things like food, and, you know, sort of beautiful courtrooms and, and beautiful chambers. And, and I'm just talking about some of the judicial aspects. I mean, there's a ton of money put into every part of the government. And, and so I, I get that that's different than the states and your question talks about the states and I definitely understand that there are issues with respect to the states. Um, but um, I think we don't value the right. And once we value the right, we will find more and more resources to be able to, you know, sort of um, give people the chance to actually have their cases tried. Yeah. 
Are there two or three things that maybe are somewhat realistic? I'm not saying slam dunk, but you know, at least plausible in today's legal, social, political, political, economic, et cetera, climate that seem hopeful in terms of what we can do going forward to restore trial by jury to a useful and meaningful role in the legal system in this country? Yeah, so one of the things I'll say, I believe that you shouldn't be able to tax or penalize anyone at all for taking a jury trial in a criminal case. Uh, but um, some countries have this limitation on how, um, how much you can penalize or tax someone for taking the jury trial. I think we could get to that point um, relatively easily um, if, you know, sort of there was some movement around how this is very, very sort of coercive and a bad practice um, to highly tax someone for taking the jury trial. Think the board and country case that I mentioned earlier. So that's on the on the on the on the on the criminal side, and I and it, you know a lot of work would have to happen, but I think that you know there's there's you see sort of precedent elsewhere um, where that works. On the on the civil side, I think that you know one of the things that I haven't sort of mentioned is 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 summary judgment, um, and summary judgment is this concept that a judge can decide prior to trial that a reasonable jury couldn't find for the plaintiff. And this is done a lot in factually intense cases. Um, and if anyone's interested, just take a look at my website and there are op-eds about this on the front page um, where you have crazy facts of employers doing certain things to employees, that is people at the employment, and, and, and these cases being dismissed before a jury before a jury gets to hear it saying, oh no, a reasonable jury couldn't find this is sexual harassment or racial harassment. Um, and I, and I, I believe all of you would say that that it was possible for a jury to say. Um, and so that procedure, it's very heavily used um, and, and you, it results in over 70% of cases where the summary judgment motion is brought or request is brought that cases are dismissed by judges. Um, I think that could be very much reformed if enough attention is brought to this issue, which then brings me again to this documentary project that I'm trying to blow this up and really show the public what our current legal system actually is. Um, and, and so I think there's hope. I think it's gonna take some years, but I think there's some hope. And while you were talking, I'm I'm copying and pasting <laughs> the link to your website, sujathomas.com, to make sure we've got it in front of everyone on both uh, Zoom and Facebook, and a couple of Fiji links as well. Um, I want to make sure that I give you the last word. We have about five six minutes here, so no no rush. Are there is there anything that we haven't covered? in this discussion that you, you'd like to cover? Anything that maybe you want to hit, hit more points about? Any closing thoughts? And again, take your time, we, we've got plenty of time. Sure, I think you know, we've talked a lot about the, the criminal jury and I think the, the civil jury is also important and I've talked a little bit about that. And um, I think that uh, we, that doesn't get there's not a lot of focus of attention on um, those cases. And I think uh, I also wanted to sort of emphasize that very, very, very few cases get tried by juries, um, less, you know, civil juries, less than 1%. And one of the problems that, I, that hasn't been mentioned is something called arbitration that many of you may know something about. We, every day, uh, because of, um, of, of, uh, credit cards of Amazon, getting a pizza from Domino's. Uh, there are arbitration clauses in almost you know, every transaction like that. And what that means you know, on a normal basis is it's sort of like, okay, you know, I'm giving up that what it is, is I'm giving up my right to a jury trial. Well, maybe that doesn't matter normally, but it does matter in the scheme of things. So when AT&T does something wrong, 
um, and it's $30 dispute for you. And maybe that's not a lot of money for one person or another person. It may be more money to some person or another. But if you can't bring what's called a class action and you have to bring it before one judge or three judges who are probably former lawyers who are paid by the company over and over and over again, the chance of you getting justice in that case, the way you would get justice before a jury is very low. And, and so, and some of you even may, um, in, with your employer, may be uh, signing, quote, signing these arbitration agreements. And if you have any type of dispute with your employer, you're subject to arbitration. And so the, the, the um, book doesn't do this as much, but the, the film that I'm making makes reference to arbitration and the problems with that and the problems with what are called repeat players. And that is these same people who are paid by companies deciding these cases. And again, there, we haven't talked much about this, but juries, they're not super diverse um, in, some time, in some circumstances, but they're more diverse <laughs> than one person deciding. And when I talk about diversity, I'm talking about all kinds of diversity. I'm talking about diversity of experience um, you know, Kirsten and I, you know, if we compared our lives, they would probably be very different, you know, um, and both of us bring good, interesting perspectives to any particular case, just like all of you do. And, and so, but that changes when you have one person decide whether that be an arbitrator, whether that be a judge, whether that be a prosecutor, or even a police officer, because one of the things that I point out in the, in the, in the um, uh, documentary is that, again, even um, in criminal cases, uh, 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 just a, a police officer can decide because, because prosecutors often don't have time uh, to investigate. So um, I just wanted to kind of point out uh, the, the, the arbitration aspect. Um, and then all of this kind of comes together to just sort of say that we have three different provisions in the Constitution that provide for a right to a jury trial. Unfortunately, that is not uh, an important part of our system, our democracy right now. And I think it contributes to our democracy not being as good as it can be. People think about voting rights all the time and how important voting rights are. Well, our rights as jurors to decide cases every day to me is just as important as voting rights. And I, and I hope that that's one of the things that you get out of this um, hour webinar. Yeah, that's such a great point. I, I like to tell people that, you know, you're called on maybe once or twice a year to cast a ballot, but you could be called on any time of the year. And with just two words, a single two word vote, you could actually save someone's life. So thank you very much for emphasizing that. It's, it's something that I think uh, is seen as sort of a lesser civic duty <laughs> very commonly. <laughs> And I would like to see it become the more prominent civic duty, just because it can be any time. You, you don't know when you're going to get called. And, and it even even participation to convict yeah. them. So we, right. we sometimes believe that 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 someone should be going, you know, being convicted and going to prison for some 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 doing some wrong. And so that's also not just mm -hmm. not just saying no. It's also saying. That that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, we tend to focus on the not guilty because we, we focus on jury nullification, but there are certainly some people that you don't want just running amok in society um, who do need to be dealt with in, in certain ways, and that can also be saving lives. Uh, just to wrap up, I want to uh, thank you so much for joining us. I think I mentioned before I could probably spend three hours yammering with you, but we only have the one. <laughs> and you've been very generous with your time, so I do want to end on time. Uh, for our, our uh, audience, either on Zoom or Facebook, please visit the links that I've provided. SujaThomas.com will uh, get you to a place to donate for the documentary and also, also the um, op-eds that uh, she mentioned. Uh, Fiji.org slash give is an easy way to contribute to Fiji to continue programs like this. And I especially want to invite you, if you're at all interested in more <laughs> of the Missing American Jury, to visit Fiji.org slash next. And you can scroll down and you'll be able to find our next virtual reading group coming up um, on this book. 
We'll be meeting in April and May. Right now I have sessions scheduled for Thursday evenings, but if we have a large enough group, we may split if you want a weekend uh, meeting time as well. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And especially thank you, Suja Thomas, Professor of Law for joining us and discussing the missing American jury. Thanks so much.